Good afternoon. I'm Susan Kester, and I'm with the Extramural Division of Neuroscience and Basic Behavioral Science at NIMH, and I want to welcome you to the Wednesday afternoon lecture series. I also want to acknowledge those colleagues watching on the video cast. You're all in for a treat. Today we're rounding out a series of outstanding neuroscience talks with a presentation from Dr. Pavan Sinha at the MIT Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Dr. Sinha received his undergraduate degree in computer science from the Indian Institute of Technology, New Delhi, and his master's and doctoral degrees from the Department of Computer Science at MIT. He's received many honors, including the National Academy of Sciences Trolland Award, an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship in Neuroscience, and the John Merck Scholar Award for Research in Developmental Disorders. He was a presidential lecturer at the Society for Neuroscience annual meeting a couple years ago, which is where Dr. Insel and I were both inspired by his presentation. Dr. Sinha's research is a rare and wonderful example combining humanitarian and scientific missions in an interdependent effort to treat congenital blindness in children in India, and then help these children and adolescents develop visual perception. At the same time, he and his team work to uncover the dynamic information processing underlying the modulation of brain circuits during this delayed learning process. It's deficits in this level of neural processing that may also underlie brain disorders such as autism. Many of us have sought to learn a new skill as adults, whether learning a language, an instrument, a craft, or a new technology. We understand implicitly that young brains learn these things more readily as we ask our children to help us out figure out our smartphones. But stories like the one you're about to hear have taught us that critical periods for neural development we learned about as undergraduates are actually at best sensitive periods, opportunities during development for more rapid learning in certain neural circuits. We can now expect that understanding the biology underlying this neuroplasticity and how this plasticity changes during sensitive periods of human development will allow us to harness these changes in the service of treating and preventing brain disorders. Dr. Sinha's lecture is titled, Learning to See Late in Life. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Susan, for that very warm introduction. It's, uh, it's an honor for me to be here. And without any exaggeration, I can say that what I'm about to describe to you would have been absolutely impossible had it not been for the support that we received from NIH. So I can think of no other place that's more appropriate for me to be describing uh, this work in. So I start with a personal observation. I have now spent an equal number of years in India as in the US. So both of these countries are now home to me. <coughs> and I can try to, to think about what the strengths and uh, challenges for the countries are. India, that you see up top, so right there is India, and it's plotted with several other nations on these two axes, one representing the GDP and the other representing the number of billionaires in, in the countries. And you see that India is near the top. Over the past two decades, India has made great economic strides. The country is considered a superstar waiting in the wings. And indeed, hardly a week passes without us hearing about just how great the economy or the middle class of the country is and is going to be. But in this constant drumbeat of success and optimistic st stories, it's easy to ignore some of the not so attractive aspects of, of the country. One that I want to focus on is healthcare. So here we are plotting, again, multiple countries on these two axes. One is the expenditure on public health as a fraction of the GDP. And the second 
is the Human Development Index, which is this aggregate statistic that takes into account things like poverty, access to healthcare, access to education. And here the picture looks much less rosy. The dashed circle represents India. The size of the circles represent the population of these different countries. And you see that India is near the, the tail end on these axes. And the outcome of this uh, poor state of affairs is quite drastic. I will focus just on one aspect of healthcare, and that's eye health. It turns out that one in every hundred Indians is blind. <coughs> so India has the largest population of blind people in the world, and that's not just because the country has a large population, but rather even the incidence of blindness in India is very high. So compared to, say, the US or Europe, the incidence of childhood blindness in the country is at least three times as high. There are several factors underlying the, this high incidence of childhood blindness. Here are a few. Corneal scarring, such as uh, the example that you see on the left. Congenital cataracts, the, an example on the right. Retinal dystrophies, infections of various kinds like trachoma, and also the congenital rubella syndrome. So just considering the, the last factor, if you look at across the globe, um, immunization programs for getting rid of rubella and measles, <clears throat> the developed world has instituted a very strong immunization program. But this continues to be a problem in the developing world. Most of the countries that you see on this map have some immunization activities called SIA, the supplementary immunization activities. But until 2009, India had not even started immunization for measles, mumps, and rubella. And that has dramatic consequences in terms of the deaths that are caused by measles and rubella. So each red dot here indicates a thousand deaths. And notice the number of red dots in India. And notice the absence of red dots in the other South Asian and Southeast Asian countries. And measles and rubella relate to blindness in a very significant way because if a woman, while she's pregnant, gets rubella, especially in the first trimester of her pregnancy, that greatly increases the odds of the child being born blind. So the lack of vaccination to rubella leads to a higher incidence of blindness in the country. So considering all of these different causes of childhood blindness, it turns out that over 40%, some would say the number is even higher, but at least 40% uh, of all cases of childhood blindness in the country are either preventable or treatable. But very few of these children actually get treated. The reason why there's a far, uh, a very weak incidence of treatment is because even though India has a robust blindness alleviation program, it's geared more towards adult eye care. So many of the eye camps that you hear about cater more to the adult population. Um, second, there is a tremendous resource scarcity. If you consider the entire population of ophthalmologists in India and the entire population of the country, that ratio turns out to be about 1 is to 100,000. In the US, it's uh, about 1 is to 10,000. Um, and that number even that 1 is to 1,000 statistic is somewhat optimistic, considering that there's a tremendous geographic imbalance. Most of the ophthalmologists work in the big cities, whereas most of the blind live out in the villages, uh, largely cut off from medical care. So for them, for the villagers, that number or that ratio is far worse than 1 is to 100,000. So the net outcome is that many children who actually could be treated for their blindness are staying blind. 
with dramatically adverse consequences on the prospects of their life. The life, lifespan for a blind child in India is on average 15 years shorter than that of a sighted child. Childhood mortality for this group is very high. About 50% of all children who are born blind do not live to see their fifth birthday. Um, less than 10% of the blind children get any kind of education. And less than 1% are employed as adults. So clearly, there is a pressing, hum pressing humanitarian need to provide treatment to children like this who have simple conditions that, uh, that can easily be, be cured. <clears throat> but in meeting this humanitarian need, we also have a very interesting scientific opportunity. And that is to see how vision begins to get put together. If you have a child who has not seen any forms from birth, and you're able to initiate sight in such a child, then you have a window into the process of visual learning. So seeing this almost perfect complementarity of the scientific quest and the humanitarian need, we launched Project Prakash about seven years ago. So Prakash is the Sanskrit word for light. And the idea is that in bringing light into the lives of these children, we also have an opportunity to illuminate some of the big questions of neuroscience. And the logo, which many people have told me looks very Irish, um, is, is actually inspired by the Indian deer, so an earthen lamp that you will see many thousands of if you go to India in October or sometimes early November for a festival called Diwali, the festival of lights, and people put up the rows upon rows of these little lamps outside their houses. So we started fairly modestly uh, once the idea for Project Prakash uh, came about. Then it was essentially me, sometimes accompanied by my father, going to a few eye clinics or uh, a few villages, trying to see just how big the magnitude of this problem is, uh, meeting up with some of the, the treatably blind children. But I was despairing about how to scale up this project. Um, I, mean, I couldn't just keep doing this with my personal finances, just considering the, the magnitude of the problem. And this is where NIH, uh, stepped in, and they, they really allowed us to make Project Prakash what it is today. So they essentially allowed us to go from this to this. And I'm not, not exaggerating, and I'm not just being nice because uh, I'm speaking in an, an NIH auditorium, but this is truly the case. Uh, we got an R21 grant from NIH, were able to demonstrate the feasibility of the project with that grant, and uh, we're able to expand the project. So Project Prakash is a combination of three things. It's outreach, going out into the villages, identifying these children, providing them treatment, and then conducting uh, follow-up studies, observing their, their visual progress. So on the outreach front, uh, with support from NIH, we have been able to have a fairly robust outreach effort where teams of doctors and healthcare workers can go out into fairly remote villages and conduct screening camps. We have gone all the way to Madhya Pradesh, uh, the region you see in the middle of the country, and also many places in the Gangetic Plains, um, all the way almost to, to a state called Bihar. And on the left, we have gone into Rajasthan, um, a state with, uh, with high temperatures and a desert. So let me show you um, a short video clip of one of these outreach sessions. <clears throat> so this one we conducted in a town called Allahabad in the Ganges. <laughs> so 
So once we have identified uh, these children who are candidates for treatment, we then bring them over to New Delhi and actually provide them the treatment. And here's a little clip about that. <clears throat> All of the surgeries are performed in New Delhi. So here's a child about to go under general anesthesia. cataract that's being excised uh, and then an intraocular lens is implanted and here you see a child who is now going to get the bandage from his treated eye removed the other eye still has a cataract This is the very first moment when he is seeing the world without that occlusion. And the question is, what happens next? So, how will vision develop? Um, and whether vision is going to develop in such a child at all? So, is the brain of a child who has been blind for several years since birth is that brain going to be plastic enough to change in response to this new visual information? And perhaps even more significantly, will the child benefit in a real practical way from this, uh, the treatment for blindness? So there are reasons to be somewhat pessimistic, as uh, Susan alluded to. There is this notion of critical periods that if the brain is deprived of visual information for the first few years of life, there's no point in treating the, the eye subsequently because the brain simply won't be able to make use or learn to adapt to that visual information. And there are several studies that have looked at the notion of critical periods. And these studies have been extrapolated into the human domain to mean that a child past the age of about four or five in such a child, it's not worth taking the risk of surgery because the visual gains are likely to be minimal. 
But there's some reason to be circumspect about that extrapolation because many of these studies, um, in fact most of these studies, have been conducted with non-human subjects, so typically mice, cats, a few with monkeys. Most of them have looked at monocular deprivation regimens where one eye is sutured shut and one looks at what the consequence of this competitive interaction is um, after a few months of deprivation. But binocular deprivation is very different from monocular deprivation. Um, the periods over which the animals have been followed up have been somewhat limited, a few months at most. And furthermore, because these are animals that one is working with, the kinds of experimental studies that have been performed have been fairly simple because the complexity of the experiment simply cannot exceed the responding capabilities of the animal. So for all of these reasons, we really ought to think about getting data from human subjects in order to, to investigate how resilient or not resilient the human brain is to early deprivation. And Project Prakash has begun to provide us some of those data. So we start with this question of brain plasticity. Simply, can the brain change in response to, to vision even late in life? We have been fortunate in getting access to an fMRI setup in New Delhi and we've begun doing studies um, with these children pre-operatively and then post-operatively as well. I'll describe two kinds of, uh, of analyses that we have done. Uh, we have data from several more studies, but uh, for the moment, let me just focus on these two. The first kind of analysis we've done is resting state functional connectivity. Um, and at the risk of being redundant, uh, I'm sure all of you already know this technique, but just to, to quickly recap it, essentially what you're doing is you're looking at the time series of uh, flow, blood flow, across different parts of the brain, so in the different voxels, and you're then correlating those different time series. So these time series that you see here correspond to the, the pattern over time of blood flow in three different parts of the brain. And by correlating these different time series, you can begin to get a sense of what might be the functional connectivity between these different regions if two regions of the brain show very similar patterns of, uh, of the time series, then one has good grounds to say that there is some kind of functional connectivity between the, those two regions. So what do we see when we work with the Prakash children? We see this. Uh, so these, these particular data come from a 21-year-old, but we see the same pattern across other, other children as well. I'm showing you the, the results of an independent components analysis on this resting state functional connectivity data. Two days prior to surgery, a week after the surgery, a month after the surgery, and four months after the surgery. And what's interesting to observe is that the power of this one component, which corresponds to the peripheral visual field in the primary visual cortex, it seems to progressively dissipate as time progresses. Uh, a somewhat subjective de description of the same data is that initially, prior to surgery and soon after surgery, most of the voxels in this part of the visual cortex are behaving in lockstep. Their activity is going up and down uh, synchronously. But then as time progresses and the child gets more and more visual input, these voxels tend to decorrelate. And this is a very interesting, well, firstly, it's a demonstration of just the ability of the brain to change, but even the, the specific kind of change it's exhibiting is interesting. Progressive decorrelation, as several papers have pointed out, such as this landmark one by Barlow and Foldiak, decorrelation is exactly what you want if you want your system to encode patterns efficiently. If you have a finite number of, of representational units, you want them to be doing as different a function as possible. Otherwise, there's too much redundancy in the system and you're not making use of your resources uh, efficiently. 
So that's what the brain seems to be doing. Uh, I mean, this is our interpretation of the data, but we do see this decorrelation across all of the children that we have, we have worked with. The second kind of analysis we have conducted uh, has to do with functional localization um, uh, of responses to different kinds of stimuli. In the normal brain, there have been several papers that have shown that there are hot spots corresponding to say respond, responses to faces, the pubiform face area, responses to places, the PPA, and responses to objects, the LOC. In the context of Project Prakash, one can ask, will these children develop the same kinds of functional localizations? If they do, will these hotspots be roughly in the same places where they are in the normal brain? So we have started doing these, uh, these kinds of studies, and I'm going to show you results just for the face object contrast. So here is another 21 year old, two days post surgery. And as I said, we are comparing the response to images of faces with images of non-face objects. And interestingly enough, you already begin to see some telltale hotspots at about the right location. As time progresses, so a month post, four months post, and 10 months post, that hotspot gets progressively stronger and by about 10 months, the response that this child is, or this person is exhibiting is pretty much indistinguishable at this course level of, of uh, looking at the data from a normal subject's response to faces. So again, attesting to the significant plasticity that even a 21-year-old uh, old's brain has. And also, the specific kind of plasticity is interesting in that the development of these uh, spatially localized responses happens to be at the same place as in the normal brain. So in terms of that question, is the brain plastic enough to make use of information from the eyes later on in life? Based on these functional imaging data, we can say yes, the brain does seem to have the ability to change even late in life. Let's turn to the second question. Can a child who has been blind from birth for several years, would that child benefit from this, the ocular treatment? And I'm going to describe to you a handful of results that we have, we have collected that seem to answer this question in the affirmative. <clears throat> but before I show you those data, <clears throat> let me show you just some informal observations. So here is an eight-year-old, uh, her name is Sumitra, and you will see her pre-operatively and then post-operatively. So we've asked Sumitra to pick up this packet of chocolates. Uh, we had her feel the, the chocolates, and look at them as much as she wanted in another room, and now she's being asked you to find these chocolates in the corridor. And you see just how profoundly visually impaired she is. <clears throat> That's her father in the background trying to help her. Now you'll see Sumitra post surgery, about a week post surgery. So already, even this anecdotal evidence points to uh, benefits that could derive from, uh, from the treatment. But we also have some more systematic data. Um, I'll take you through six different uh, uh, data sets that we've collected very, very quickly. So the first one has to do with contrast sensitivity, a very basic level of, uh, of characterization of visual function. And I need to thank Peter Bex's lab at the Scapens Eye Research Institute for giving us um, a program called the QCSF, the Quick Assessment of CSF. Um, we've been able to make use of that program to analyze 
children's CSF functions in a matter of a few minutes. So in red are control subjects and in blue are a few of the Prakash children. And you see that even though they are not normal, they are, this is a, a, a tremendous improvement over just light perception. So even after just a few months, you begin to see uh, this significantly improved contrast uh, sensitivity function. Um, global motion perception, the ability to, to detect coherently moving collections of dots. So this is a task that was popularized by Bill Newson and his colleagues. What we're trying to determine is the threshold proportion of dots that need to move together in order for the observer to detect that there is coherent motion in a particular direction. Control subjects show thresholds of about 10% to 12%. Two days post-op, post the children are already doing quite well. Uh, some of them are showing thresholds of about 15%. On average, I would say it's about 20, 25%. And that seems to improve over the ensuing months again showing that there is a behavioral benefit to be derived from, from the surgery. We've also looked at the development of spatial imagery in these children. Um, so the task here is they're given these pegboards. These are raised pegs. Uh, so even before they can see, we ask them to feel these pegboards and then imagine that a little mouse is jumping from peg to peg, and we're giving them commands of different lengths. That the mouse, let's say, starts from the center, and then jumps uh, one step to the top, and then jumps one step to the left. And they have to imagine in their mind's eye where the mouse would be after these two or three or four levels of commands. So what you see in blue bars are the pre-op performances at different levels of complexity. So it could be a two by two pegboard, three by three, or, or four by four, and different numbers of, uh, of commands that we're giving to the children. And what you see is, if you just look, look at the blue bars, that as the complexity increases, the performance of these pre-operative children tends to go down. After surgery, so two months post-op, they do much better at the same task, attesting to an improvement in their ability to imagine spatial structures. We have also looked at some higher order visual skills, such as the face non-face uh, classification task. Here is a girl at about one week uh, after surgery. And she is responding to this question, is this a face? So you can tell that she is making many errors. Um, but it turns out that you let some time elapse. So if you have days post-surgery and you plot the classification accuracy of such a girl, it registers a very quick increase. And by about a month to a month and a half post-surgery, these children begin doing very well at the face non-face classification task. A slight variation on this face non-face classification is face localization. Uh, after being given a complex natural scene, being able to point to the locations of the faces in that scene. And here again, the story seems to be that performance improves very quickly. So here we are looking at the face detection rate. Uh, ignore the different colors, just look at the, the overall uh, increase in performance. Um, so Starting out at a fairly poor level, performance improves significantly over the first one month and then improves even a little more 
uh, over the ensuing months. The development of cross-modal mappings. So for you and me, it's an easy task to connect the sensation, the pattern of sensation in one modality with sensations in another modality. I can feel this object in total darkness and subsequently if you were to show me this object and some other object and ask me which was the object that you had just felt, I would have no problem at all pointing to the correct object. So somehow we have this mapping between vision and touch. But the question is how do we get this mapping? Is this a mapping that we are born with or is it a mapping that we have to acquire? And this question as it turns out is one of these preeminent questions in philosophy that goes by the name of the Molyneux query. Um, so William Molyneux in 1688, uh, Molyneux was a, a philosopher slash scientist in Ireland. So he wrote a letter to John Locke, one of the preeminent British philosophers where he asked this question. Suppose a man born blind and taught by his touch to distinguish between a cube and a sphere. Suppose the blind man be made to see. Query whether by his sight before he touched them, he could now distinguish and tell which is the globe and which is the cube. So would a blind person immediately upon gaining sight be able to transfer his tactile knowledge to visual discrimination. This question uh, remained open for the past three centuries because there weren't any subjects on whom this question could be, uh, with whom this question could be studied. And with the Project Prakash children, for the first time we had an opportunity to address this question. And the answer turns out to be this interesting two-part answer. So immediately after the onset of sight, these children perform perfectly on intramodal uh, uh, recognition. So if you show them an object and then show them that object and another object and ask them which was the object they had just seen, they are perfectly fine at that task. So the visual apparatus is working. Similarly, they can feel an object and then you give them that object and another object to feel and they can tell you which was the object they had been feeling. So vision to vision and vision uh, touch to touch works just fine and that's what you're seeing in these different plots corresponding to five different subjects, that's the average. So those two things are fine but the touch to vision transfer that the Molyneux question focuses on, they are at chance on. So there is no immediate transfer from touch to vision in the newly sighted. But attesting to the tremendous learning capabilities of the brain, you give them even as little as a week post-surgery and you retest them on different objects and they show a tremendous improvement in their mapping abilities. So these children who were at chance in the first session, they are now showing significantly better than chance performance in just a week or two weeks after surgery. Again, underlining the, the powers of learning that the brain has despite several years of deprivation. And finally, uh, we've looked at image parsing. So how is it that we can take in, a look at an image like this, and even though this image is really a collection of many little regions of different colors and different luminances, we are able to parse it into distinct objects. So would these children be able to do this very complicated uh, computation? And it turns out that they do. They start out uh, facing a tremendous problem of overfragmentation. You show them images like this and you ask them where are the objects and they will point to each region of a different color or a different luminance. That becomes uh, the object to them. On this cricket ball, even the shadow of the cricket ball becomes a distinct object. But you let enough time elapse and the performance changes. So on these tasks of how many objects are there, what are their names, the performance changes from being completely at chance to being significantly above chance. So on the image passing task as well, these children show significant gains 
after, after gaining sight. So uh, we have looked at the brain imaging data suggesting that there is tremendous plasticity in the brain and the behavioral results suggest that a child can indeed benefit from treatment even late in life. And I want this to be a qualified yes. I mean, I don't want to say that there is no difference in the vision of these children from the vision of normally sighted children. Because as you saw in the contrast sensitivity function graphs, the acuity of these children is still uh, significantly impaired. But even with that reduced acuity, these children are able to acquire significant visual function. So the clinical significance of these findings is the obvious one, that treatment programs ought to be made available to all children, irrespective of the age at which they present themselves at the hospital. And Project Prakash has certainly taken that uh, result to heart. We have tried to provide treatment to as many of the children as we, as we can. So through many such eye camps of the kind you saw in the video, we have been able to screen over 28,000 children so far <clears throat> and provide treatment to over 400 of them um, and non-surgical treatments to over 1,400 of them. So in terms of the research component of Project Prakash, the question of whether recovery will happen, I think that we can be fairly confident that recovery does happen, but there's this additional very interesting component to the question and that is what are the mechanisms of this recovery and in the last section of my talk I, I'll very quickly outline some tentative hypotheses that we have on that front. So I've talked about a handful of, of skills that these children seem to be learning. They're learning face detection, they're learning to map, touch to vision, they're learning to do visual integration and so on. There are many such things. Is it the case that each one of these visual ability has its own kind of a learning mechanism? Or is it the case that there are some common underlying mechanisms that, that lead to learning in all of these different threads? So are there some fundamental scaffolds that all of these different visual skills build upon? And some of the data that we are getting leads us to believe that there may be some truth to this idea. Three of the results that are leading us to this, to this idea, I'll briefly summarize next. This is the first result. Immediately after the onset of sight, these children are sensitive to cross-modal synchrony. So in this experiment, for instance, the child sees two displays, and the display is a very simple one. It shows a ball bouncing, moving left and right in a box, and whenever it touches the wall, there's a click. So that's what's shown out here. So imagine that this is the audio stream. So in one of these two displays, the bounce of the, the visual bounce is synchronized with the timing of the click. In the other one, it's out of phase. And the task of the child is simply to say which of these two displays, uh, which ball is making this sound. They are able to do this right away. So on the very day that you open their bandages, they are sensitive to this. You can come up with a slightly different version of the same general idea. So you present two talking heads. We haven't ever presented Brian Williams, but <laughs> this is just an example. <coughs> um, so you present two talking heads and an audio stream, and the audio stream is consistent with one of the talking heads. The other talking head is going through the mouth movements, but it's not consistent with the audio stream. And what you find is that children are able to do this task. So you ask the child which uh, face is doing the talking, and they're able to point to the correct face. And this is not language dependent. So we could actually have used Brian Williams talking in English and the children would have been able to do just fine. So that's one result, that this ability to detect cross-modal synchrony is available right from the outset. Second, we find that visual integration 
relies critically upon motion cues. So here's a, a video clip that some of you I know have already seen. The display is static and uh, the person cannot make out what is the, the pattern that you see. Motion brings about an immediate difference and no other cue has the same effect. So you could have colored the square and the, and the circle with different colors. So you could have a, a red circle, a blue square, and he would still, so long as it's static, he would still over, over fragment it. It's only motion that seems to have this, this effect. Um, yeah, just to, uh, these are just some data making the same point that in the static case, these individuals are at chance, but as soon as you introduce motion, their performance improves. And the third result is that if you were to track the development of object concepts in these children, so over time, these children will recognize more and more object categories. And you can undertake a systematic study of what are the object categories that they're beginning to recognize at different times. There's a very interesting trend there. So here I'm showing you data from one subject. Um, we have shown him these different natural images. He can recognize only a subset of these, and that subset is shown outlined in, in red. For a long time, we couldn't really figure out what is special about the images that the person is recognizing, what distinguishes these from the images that he's not recognizing. They seem to be at about the same level of complexity, there didn't seem to be any obvious differences in terms of inclusion or exclusion of background, number of colors and such. However, if you were to, uh, if you were to, to attach motility ratings to these images, so how likely is it that the object depicted in these pictures has moved in the person's experience? So you get from independent observers, you get those motility ratings, and shown in red are the images that normal observers would say, yes, these depict motile objects and the other ones depict immotile objects. And you then look at the pattern of recognition performance from, say, the individual I was just showing you. That is the, the congruence. So it's almost exactly the group of objects that have moved that are being recognized subsequently. And this is, a, it's not just a chance occurrence, uh, it's statistically very significant and we see the same congruence across all of the children that we work with. And I'll skip through that. So these results and a few others are leading us to believe that many of those other skills that we're looking at are really drawing upon this common mechanism of dynamic information processing. Looking at spatial patterns, not just as spatial patterns, but rather as things that change in time. So there's a lot to be said about this, and I'm going to, to uh, I'm happy to chat later, but for the moment, suffice it to say that instead of looking at, say, a pattern like this, just in the XY plane, what we believe is happening is that, is that the brain is looking at the time course of change. So it's looking at the trajectories that these different visual entities are sweeping through. So most of the information for the immediate task of vision and also for learning how to do vision with static images, most of that information is contained in these, in these time trajectories. So we have been making use of this fairly 
straightforward conceptual idea um, in our computational work in order to do things like parse fairly complex natural uh, sequences. So here is one natural sequence. And if you were to, uh, to subject any frame from the sequence to an image segmentation routine, that image segmentation routine would fail catastrophically. There are just too many disparate colors, too many different luminances. But if you make use of these motion trajectories, you're able to do a terrific uh, job of segregating objects, as we see with the Prakash children. We have also made use of this general idea in order to, to model object concept learning um, in neonates. So it, some of you uh, have personally observed, and I'm sure all of you have read about, the amazing face perception abilities of newborns. Within a couple of weeks after birth, uh, newborns are able to orient towards faces. And that's led to the idea that maybe the brain is coming pre-wired with a face template. What we are showing through our computational simulations, making use of motion information in baby uh, perspective videos, is that just relying upon the motion information in these, in these sequences, you can already begin to extract face concepts after just a few minutes worth of experience. So two weeks is entirely too long you can just have half a day's worth of, of visual input, and you can have a system without any prior knowledge about faces, discover faces autonomously. And this hypothesis has all, also pointed to some unexpected connections between the Prakash work and some aspects of neurology, specifically autism. So in autism, <coughs> There are several papers that have pointed out that many aspects of visual performance are impaired. So visual integration has been reported to be impaired. Face perception is impaired. Cross-modal integration seems to be affected. Perception of causality is affected. So it could be that this constellation of deficits in autism is arising from a constellation of, of impairments in the neural structures. Or if there's any truth to this idea that there's a common scaffolding that's leading to the development of all of these different abilities, then the impairment might lie out here, which would then manifest itself across these multiple different avenues. So we have been doing some studies at MIT uh, with seemingly normally sighted uh, children and adults with autism to try to examine whether dynamic information processing in these individuals might in fact be, be affected. Um, and I will show you two very short video clips illustrating one of the experiments that we have conducted where we are, where we are uh, forcing the subject to be engaged in a dynamic task, in this case playing Pong, uh, so here's the ball that will bounce around within this room. They have to move the paddle to keep the ball inside. And while they're doing that, we are also tracking their eye movements. And that's shown in red. So here is a, whoops, here is a control participant playing Pong. And what you notice is that this participant is able to make use of the dynamic information that has elapsed up to a certain point in order to predict what's going to happen next. And that predictive ability is absolutely key to dealing with the dynamic world. So you see that they are looking at the point where the ball is going to strike well before the ball gets there. Now look at the traces from a child with autism. So instead of making predictive uh, gazes, this child seems to be following where the ball uh, has been. So this is just uh, one example of the kinds of studies we are doing in order to get at the issue of dynamic information processing and how it might be affected in, in autism.
our goal here is to flesh out this causal, causal chain. So is it possible that dynamic information processing causes some integration impairments which then lead to other sequelae that eventually manifest themselves as the phenotype of autism. So since I'm about out of time, let me just summarize. So Project Prakash is a fairly young project as these big projects go. Uh, it formally was launched about seven years ago. But over these past few years, um, it has had some gratifying uh, outcomes. It has given us some insights into the brain mechanisms of plasticity and learning. It has given us some unexpected hypotheses about conditions like autism. It has guided the design of our artificial intelligence systems for autonomous visual learning. And it has played an important role in the educational trajectories of the students who have been involved in the project. Most importantly, of course, it has played a role, howsoever modest, in alleviating the problem of childhood blindness. There are several challenges that lie ahead of us. Let me mention three. The first is the challenge of treatment. So I said, and you saw, that the contrast sensitivity function of these children is not normal. And if you just plot the Snellen acuities or the Logmar acuities across these about 20 children, you notice that their acuities are significantly worse than normal. And these acuities, so the reds are the acuities measured a week after surgery, and the blues are their acuities measured six months after surgery. And you see that the acuity does not change very much. So is it the case that these children are forevermore going to have this reduced acuity? If so, then that's bad news because one of the big functions of having high acuity is to be able to see things at a distance. And by leaving them with this poor acuity, we are essentially leaving them blind to much of the visual information out in the far distance. So what we would like to see is whether there's any possibility of an intervention that would improve visual acuity. And we have some uh, tentative ideas uh, that we are, we are now trying out with the Prakash kids. And there would be an obvious application of any uh, interventions that we develop in the Prakash context because amblyopia has a similar kind of an issue the best corrected acuity is worse than 2020. And it would be interesting to see whether some of the interventions we develop for Prakash carry over to amblyopia. So that's one challenge, a challenge of treatment. The second is the challenge of scale. So I said that we had surgically treated over 400 children and taken in isolation, that seems like an impressive number for an academic project, but you consider the total size of the population of blind children in, in India, and it begins to seem very deficient. So in green is the proportion of children we have touched, and in red are all the children who need treatment. So we need to enhance the scale of the, of the operation. And finally, we need to increase the scope of the project. So far, Project Prakash has been a merging of, of medical care and scientific research. And it has been a very, very satisfying intermeshing. But more and more, as we follow the trajectories of the children who are, who are being treated as part of Project Prakash, we are finding out that these children are not really deriving the full benefits of the treatment. Most particularly, these children are not getting educated. The majority of them stay out of the schooling system because they reduced acuity and the poverty of the parents um, essentially compromises their ability to be part of a mainstream school. So what we feel is very important to really have the kind of impact that we want Project Prakash uh, to have on these children is to add a third component to our work and that would be education. So after the surgery, we would like to provide all of the children with a compressed course, say a six-month course, 
which brings them to an age appropriate level in the educational status, after which they can be mainstreamed into regular schools. So it's a, it's a daunting undertaking. We need to integrate these three components. And one of the best ways we believe that this integration can be accomplished is by physically co-locating these three facilities. So to have one campus that has a pediatric hospital, a school for the children, and also a scientific research facility. So we are, we are drawing up plans to create such a center for children, the Prakash Center for Children. Uh, we believe that an optimal location for that center would be around here in a town called Haridwar, um, which sits at the beginning of the Gangetic Plains. The Gangetic Plains, where the river Ganges flows, this is the population center for India. And it's also the part of the country that is perhaps the most impoverished in terms of medical care. But because Haridwar is a very important pilgrimage center, it is very well connected to, uh, to the Gangetic Plains. So we would be able to, to, to provide access to the children in this part of the country. So it's, it's a, as I said, a very daunting challenge. Um, the, this is forcing us to consider the kinds of issues of raising resources, contacting politicians and policymakers that I've never dealt with before. And sometimes I just want to be a basic scientist. Uh, I would just rather do my behavioral psychophysical studies or my computational models and not have to think about that. But at those times, it's important to, uh, to remember Einstein's famous words, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. So knowing that it is within our capability to, to help such a child, we have the treatment options. Also knowing what the magnitude of this problem is, we have an obligation to do something about it. I mean, all of us have led fairly privileged lives, and I, f I feel that we have an obligation to do uh, something on a problem that is eminently, uh, uh, eminently solvable and more than an obligation, it feels like an opportunity. So my students and I, every time we go to India, every time we meet with these children and we are able to see the impact of this little intervention from our side on the child's life and the child's family's life, it's a reminder to us just what an opportunity this is to not only do um, some good for the children, but also to feel very good about ourselves. So it's, it's a challenge that my students and I are, are looking forward to, to undertaking in the coming years. Thank you very much. Fascinating, and, and some of the pictures of the children made my own eyes well up. Um, I'm wondering if you've ever uncovered anything such as the reaction to something we deem repulsive, beautiful, ugly, or whether they remain, you know, quote unquote, blind to these kind of perhaps prejudices or something inherent. That's an yeah, it's an important question. So so far we have not not uh, looked at that dimension. So uh, whether children whether the newly sighted children would, uh, would categorize beauty or aesthetics in the same way as, as normally sighted individuals would. Um, we are considering uh, tackling a very small version of that question in terms of facial aesthetics. So if you have a collection of faces that have been rated as being more or less attractive by normally sighted observers, how quickly do these children begin to show uh, ratings of aesthetics that are similar to the normally cited. But it's a very small version of your much larger question, and we don't really have data on that yet. Uh, so with regard to your results about the significance of motion in learning to recognize objects, um, <coughs> objects could move 
on their own, like animate objects or fans, they could also, uh, uh, the retinal image could move as a person experiences it from different vantage points. Uh, I'm wondering if you've explored. Yeah, those uh, uh, very important point. So you could have movement on the retina, either because of object motion or because of ego motion. And ego motion is far less effective than object motion. So uh, the child could move around the table on which we have placed some objects, and we ask them, what are these objects? And they are far worse at recognizing those objects by moving themselves than if you were to, to move the object around. And I think it's partly because ego motion gives you a less rich sense of the connectivity relationships or the lack of connectivity relationships between objects. Because if you are moving around a static table, then the object is still connected to the table. Uh, it's still perhaps connected to other objects. Whereas the movement of an isolated object gives you a very clear segregation signal. Are there any strategies to improve the visual coordination in the autistic uh, children based on your studies? Like, I mean, like, uh, so there would be implications. At the moment, we do not have any interventions uh, uh, designed because it's very early in, the, uh, in our investigation. So first, we need to confirm whether an impairment in dynamic information processing is, in fact, the cause for some of the other impairments one observes. <clears throat> if that's the case, then there would be certainly a very clear uh, suggestion for how we would design interventions because we would then target precisely this visual ability. So instead of, of uh, trying to teach the child, uh, well, look, this is an angry face, this is a sad face, that would be an outcome of a more core intervention that's telling them about dynamics uh, of the world. But we are not quite there yet. I wanted to follow up on the uh, category, uh, their ability to uh, recognize things that were moving objects. And I was curious about the fish and the tree. Uh, how often that happened and were they not familiar with <coughs> fish and had they seen trees moving while zipping past in a car? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think we can make a story uh, like that and that would just increase the, the congruence in our results. Um, but most of the observers, uh, most of the normally sighted observers said, well, we won't really call a tree a motile object. As for the fish, it's kind of variable. So most of the children uh, that we work with tend not to see, tend not to recognize uh, the fish. And the just so story there would be that these children have never really seen a fish. They have been in villages that are not close to bodies of water. So maybe that's the answer. Can I follow up on that? So this is Sherry Wiggs from oh, NEI. Hey, Hi. Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> so I was interested in those same um, stimuli and thinking about the children's experience with those in the real world. And so for me, with the tree, they may have had the experience of the tree moving in the wind, whereas if I'm asked if that's a mobile object, I'm thinking, no, it's not going to move on its own. So maybe, are you able to parse out their familiarity yeah. with these, because, for instance, a set of batteries, they probably rarely see. Yes, a very good question. Uh, so when we were considering what kinds of factors might explain the pattern of performance that we're getting, we considered many purely visual factors, the number of colors in the image, uh, uh, the entropy of the image, the complexity, and also familiarity. So we would, uh, we would read out names of objects and ask the children, have you ever felt this object? And many of the objects that they can't recognize visually, they had felt. So familiarity did not seem to be a very predictive uh, factor for this. I'm afraid we need to make that the last question for now. We have a reception graciously sponsored by the FAES next door in the library, and I'd like to invite everybody to come join with our speaker and chat with him informally at the reception. Thank you. Thank you very much.